Hello tankers and tankettes and welcome to my Tankfest 2015 video. This is attempt number I don't even know what but I've tried a couple of times and my most successful recording so far or attempt at sitting down and recording was over 40 minutes long and I thought that was a bit too long and there was a bit too much waffle so here we are with attempt number whatever. Now the reason I am somewhat delayed bringing this out is um, as I said in the, the live TOG gameplay video that I did uh, I spent probably a day and a half just processing the photos. I've done several attempts already as I've alluded to and was just not happy with them. And then Wargaming um, I think Thursday announced that they uh, were making available footage that they themselves had shot at Tankfest and I thought okay actually I'm gonna grab some of that and I got like three quarters of it maybe and it took literally a solid day of downloading. It must have been about 30 gigabytes of data, so my poor internet pigeons were quite tired after that. But uh, that means that it's not just my own photos, and I've got photos from one or two other people as well to share with you, but uh, with permission obviously. But I've also got some clips of things that I didn't even get to see myself, or didn't see very much of, particularly the arena shows, because they had a bunch of stuff going on in the arena both days, and myself, Circon and the rest, we only saw parts of that. Just purely because it was so busy. I'm actually going to start off though with um, the Thursday and Friday. And I, the, the, the Thursday before was the day I had booked everything for to, to travel down to at least the south coast because my brother lives in Brighton and I thought okay I'll go down a day early, I will get to Brighton kind of mid-afternoon, I'll be able to spend the rest of the day with him and we'll hang out and it'll be cool. Unfortunately, what actually happened was that the uh, morning flight from Stornoway Airport, my local airport, was cancelled entirely due to fog. So, okay, I thought, well, I'll just wait around for the next flight. And I was actually quite fortunate to get on the next flight because not everybody from the cancelled flight was able to then be moved over to the next one. So, okay, I'll wait a couple of hours, it'll be fine sat around for about four hours and suddenly you know the, the point where we should have been going through to to go to departures and start boarding and whatever an announcement came through in fact we were actually doing the departures thing uh, an announcement came through and said we can't fly the plane because uh, something broke so they had to get a replacement plane in which took a further three hours so all in all i was sat in stornoway airport for about seven hours just over seven hours solid that was not particularly fun because it's not a particularly big airport. So by the time we got to the first picture that you're seeing here with me boarding the plane, it was with a considerable sense of relief. Now, my connecting flights to Glasgow, uh, uh, from Glasgow, naturally that was late as well, um, but only by half an hour. So all told, by the time I finally did get to Brighton, it was half 11 at night. So I basically went along to where my brother was staying, fell into a bed. But in the morning we at least got to go and have breakfast somewhere. It was uh, rather nice and civilised. And Brighton's actually quite nice. I've been there a couple of times before, but uh, uh, we didn't really get a chance to go around and do much. We literally just went and got breakfast. I did notice in the train station, though, they had this rather peculiar piano that said, Play me! And I was tempted to go up and have a little tinkle, but then I thought, well, I've read Alice in Wonderland. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly wary of what's going to happen. So I left that alone in the end. One short train ride later, well I say short, it was actually a couple of hours, I arrived in Bournemouth and I could have at that point immediately then hopped on a train to Wool, which is the closest station to Bovington, uh, but instead I decided I was going to hang around because Sir Con had already arrived and gone to the hotel and I knew that Billy, Max and Snooze were all on the way so I waited around for them, uh, we all met and we all traipsed off to the hotel and Billy was able to show us the way because it's his neck of the woods, he's actually from Poole which is slightly along the, the coast and when we finally got to the hotel, well, uh, <laughs> guess who we saw, yes the sight that greeted us and it was actually kind of funny meeting these guys um, like in the flesh for the first time because I've known them all for a while now but this is the first time I've ever met any of them face to face, so it was a little bit surreal and it kind of always is when you meet somebody that you've known online for a while. Um, but uh, it was, yeah, it was like we all knew each other and we were all just like, okay, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I know who that person is, even though I may not necessarily be familiar with their, you know, with their face. That was a weird way of putting it, but anyway. <laughs> so at that point we were all in uh, need of food pretty much so we all traipsed off to uh, Harry Ramsden's which is a rather expensive uh, it's basically a fish and chip restaurant 
It's a bit of an odd, like, I don't quite get Harry Ramsden's, but that was one of the closer places that did food. Unfortunately, it involved going up and down uh, a slight incline. I call it a slight incline. To circ on it was probably a... a, a, a the equivalent of, of traipsing up the side of K2 or something, because, you know, he's from the Netherlands. They're not used to walking up and down slopes. It was it was hard going, poor guy. Billy there with his trademark orange juice. Um, yeah, he, he just was like, yeah, pint of orange juice, please. And then proceeded to <laughs> just Billy things. So it was after that point where we'd all arrived and we'd fi- we'd have some food and we all then decided, okay, now we should probably go and try and get to the museum. Because what Wargaming had done on the Fridays, they'd laid on a, a, a day of um, kind of guided events around the museum and you were basically getting to see various things um, that... On the Saturday and Sunday, you wouldn't really necessarily get a good view of because the place would be full of people, and so it was full of people. So we unfortunately missed a whole bunch of that myself, Sircon, Snooze, Maxwell, and Billy. Well, actually, I say Billy. Billy wasn't there, and Snooze wasn't there because um, they were. It was the community contributors, so they unfortunately were not officially that. You know, I suppose we could have tried to black them in, but uh, anyway. So we arrived and we saw that banner, and you can see Circle's reaction to that banner. Yes, just just let that soak in. Apparently, Ektar um, said that that it, well, he said that apparently um, there had been a bit of miscommunication. So by the time the banners all came back and they were printed, he just kind of looked at them and went, oh, "Okay, we're just going to have to go with it." So at that point, we uh, we went inside. Uh, we got to wander through the World War Two Hall, and we went through to Tamiya Hall, which is where all the wargaming stuff was set up, and that's where the Tog lives. So there you go. I got to see the Tog face to face, and it is every bit as ridiculous as it is in World of Tanks. Although actually, in World of Tanks, it it's the proportions seem a little off. Actually, it it looks longer in World of Tanks than when you're actually standing next to the thing, but it's still a fairly ridiculously long tank, like it's still hard to believe that this was built seriously for World War Two. and you, you look at some of the other machines that are around and you think, why did anyone think this was a good idea? But it was built and it is ridiculous and apparently it's one of the more popular exhibits now that World of Tanks has become a more popular game. People go up to it and go, that's the dog, whereas previously it was just sitting in a corner unregarded. We also met up with uh, various other people that had been there for a lot longer during the day and, uh, you know, High Fly, Jingles, Rita Gamer, QB was there, uh, all the other community contributors that they had invited and, of course, the various Wargaming community staff, including Mr. Ektar himself, just lording it, lording it over us all, you know, just... just just feel, feel free to make up your own caption for that one, like, you know, worship me, mortals, or something, I don't know. They also uh, provided, like, they had a, a kind of a, a list, uh, a schedule for the day. And the reason why we'd missed most of it was because a lot of us had made our travel plans before they announced this uh, itinerary for the day. So it was kind of difficult, if not impossible, to change plans by the time we learned of it. And Circon especially would have meant spending several hundred euros on new flights. For me, not quite that much, but it still would have meant booking new trains, and my Thursday would have not had to have been a disaster. Like, I would have had to have gone straight there on Thursday. I would have had to have somewhere to stay overnight on Thursday. Um, so as it was, um, we missed a bunch of it, but we were there in time for the kind of the, the free play session with the event accounts, and you can see there are certain... So Mr. Highflyer playing a certain tier 10 British artillery. Uh, <laughs> and it was funny because uh, his wife's sister Yister was there as well, playing exactly the same thing. So just incorrigible, the pair of them. And it's funny, they weren't even, uh, it was like slightly cheeky of them. They weren't actually there for the Saturday and Sunday. So if you didn't see them on Saturday and Sunday, that's why. Uh, but maybe they'll be around for the whole thing next weekend. I don't know. So after that point, we uh, all traipsed off to a barbecue. Um, so we were treated to some free food courtesy of Wargaming and it was all very pleasant and we all sat around and had a chat and I got to speak to various people uh, including Mr Quickie Baby who I've not really uh, crossed paths with before but we had a, a, a nice chat and Ike was there my counterpart from QB stream and uh, yeah at that point well we got the train back I think we'd gotten a taxi there and we, we did all three days that we went along we got taxis there but we were splitting the cost between us so it actually kind of worked out as being not that expensive uh, although with four people in a taxi um i was usually the one that was squeezed in the middle on the back seat so 
<laughs> yes, I mean, there are sometimes disadvantages to being the uh, ridiculously skinny one. So, that was the Friday. Um, the Thursday had been a bit of a disaster, but Friday was all right, and it was good meeting up with everyone, and uh, it was nice to have a bit of time to just hang out, because we, we kind of wanted to just chill before we went along to the museum, but we were also aware that we were missing all the uh, events that they'd laid on uh, just for us. So uh, that won out in the end, and we did go along after we'd, uh, we'd at least had some food. The Saturday was actually uh, it's a much nicer day in terms of the weather. As you can see, it was uh, very sunny, blue skies. We actually ended up with sunburn, uh, some of us, especially Maxwell, um, he, yeah, uh, we actually met up with um, Island Man 224, who's the uh, deputy commander of the Cirque for Willow Tanks clan, and he was like, I've got some sunblock, because none of us had thought to bring sunblock, you know, it, when I'm living at home, it's, it's, well, I've got some in the house, it's just, it's usually not really necessary for me to put any on, because it's usually not that sunny. Um, but he said, here, have some sunblock, you know, I've, I've got some, so we're rubbing this stuff on. And then it turned out later it was actually, um, like, after sun lotion, not actual sunblock. So we weren't quite as badly burned as we might have been, but we were a bit burned. And my arms and, and neck were particularly red, but I had my hat on, so my face was spread the worst of it. Maxwell, unfortunately, not so much. He went around looking like a cherry tomato for uh, most of the weekend. As you can see, it was really very busy, and that was uh, one of the major reasons why I didn't get to see much of the arena stuff, just because it was very hard to get a good view. We did, however, um, on the Saturday particularly, we went and had a look at the Conservation Hall, which is closed most of the time. It's only during these uh, event weekends that you can actually get in as a member of the public. But trying to get there proved a bit difficult because, uh, yeah, as you can see, Sir Gon kept getting recognised, um, and the rest of us, of course, we were... We were mostly sticking together as a group on the Saturday. So people were like, oh, you're, you're Maxwell, and you're Pointy Head Jedi, and you're Snooze. And so yeah, that was that was kind of fun. Jingles, of course, if you've seen his video, you'll know he had it much worse. He basically stepped through the door on the Saturday, and that was it. He got recognized, immediately a queue formed, and that was his next six hours. Uh, so uh, yeah, the Sircon's at kind of the level where he could wander around, and yeah, he was getting stopped fairly often, but he wasn't getting massive queues for me. And I think QB um, at various points was set up next to the war gaming booth, and he had a lot of people around him as well. Like he was also a, a pretty busy guy during the weekend. So on the way to the conservation hall, I saw my scorpion. I was already aware from um, circling Brett Fifty that uh, at Bovington, well, you can see there the. Uh, <laughs> the license plate it's got my initials on therefore it must be mine um so this scorpion was there and i was keen to see if i could uh, uh catch a sight of it and it was quite conveniently parked out right in front of the conservation hall so there's me very awkwardly pointing at it that must be the most awkward point uh, just ever and we also and um, there's more people we bumped into we also saw a lot of people were wearing circon's shirts i say a lot more than circon was expecting um as he said that uh, he thought he'd maybe see one or two people wearing his his uh, twitch shirts that he made available but um there, there were more than a few there must have been maybe a dozen people at least wandering around with those on so that was kind of cool to see there were actually i, I think wargaming being a uh, a big sponsor this year um really um like it, it got the word out more than than maybe has happened in previous years because apparently it was very busy compared to even last year like both days were sold out so uh, it was interesting like we, we got to le meet a lot of people that were there because of world of tanks essentially and of course there were people that have, were old hands that had been there previously people that were there for the tanks and probably never heard of world of tanks and didn't even like you know were barely aware what a video game was i suppose but um yeah bovington's like that, that that to me is interesting that you get the world of tanks has brought that to people that people are then interested to go and see the actual machines because they're surprisingly like you don't get the sense of scale and you can see some of the photos from the conservation hall here where people standing next to them you don't get that sense of scale from the game necessarily how how imposing some of these machines are and this is just the conservation hall as well like th there are there were some pretty big machines in there i think the tortoise was the biggest one they had but um the, uh, the the scale in World of Tanks is just it it's not there and 
then you get in the main World War Two hall where they've got the like the Yag Tiger, which is one of the biggest machines they've got, and it's huge. It really is. Like you just, it must have been terrifying facing these things on the battlefield because these are these are big, imposing metal. You know, you just you would not want to be on the wrong end of of really any of those guns, and, and even machines like the the early war. Um, uh, the British cruiser tanks, for instance, uh, they're still pretty big tanks. You just you don't get that sense of scale from the game at all. So as you can see, the conservation hall's pretty packed. Um, that's just the stuff that was in there, you know, stuff that's awaiting restoration and conservation. Um, they've actually got a fair number of vehicles at Bovington, like I think possibly more than they actually have space to display. So it's, it's probably a perennial problem when you're. Uh, running a museum for what are essentially a lot of quite large objects is just having enough space to display everything so yeah but it wasn't just about the tanks there were also a whole bunch of reenactors and I've only got one photo um, that's that's mine of the the reenactors but uh, there are a couple more courtesy of uh, somebody else with permission and apparently this is a like they, they come back quite a lot um, like every year and there are also events at Bovington where they um, also do things with various reenactors in uh, various kinds of historical costume. Jingles himself was actually wearing an American tanker's uniform of World War II um, and Billy there, well, um, they also had next to this area, they had a bunch of tents where they were selling stuff. The tank park was then a little bit further down where there was kind of like the holding area for all the stuff that was being shown in the arena at various points. Uh, I think some of it was just out on display. But yeah, Billy there also uh, <laughs> showing, uh, was that a, a pickle halb? I can't remember how you say that, but uh, one of the, the spiky World War One German helmets. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like we picked it up and it was like, Billy, you must wear this. And uh, well, he took it all with good humor. He took most of the weekend with good humor, I have to say. So I've got a couple of pictures of the tank park and some of the machines are quite recognisable, others you might not. Uh, Tiger 131, obviously very recognisable, they do a whole uh, day around that, Tiger Day. And if you actually look in Jingles' videos you can uh, uh, see that in action. But they also had it later on driving around and I've got some clips of that courtesy of Wargaming. And they also had some reproduction tanks, World War One tanks. There are actually a few around in the, the main hall as well of course, um, the FT-17 being Probably the most famous example to most people. They also had a, a, a whole mix of, like, it was a lot of modern tanks, kind of Cold War era tanks, and, of course, the historical tanks. And there's actually a surprising number of the kind of World War II era ones that are still capable of being driven around. Not as many, obviously, as things like the Leopards there, which I think the ex-Canadian Army Leopard ones. Um, they actually had their own specific display at one point. And... Uh, it, yeah, it, it's 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 cool seeing these things driving around, and it's it's I, I I don't know. It's like you don't again we're back to you don't get a sense of a lot of of how these machines really sound or feel in World of Tanks because it's all very um, I don't know how to put it exactly, but it's 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 quite sanitized, and I mean that in a way that you don't get a sense of the 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 amount of like grit and dust that these things kick out and how noisy they are and all the fumes and like you, you don't get that on a computer screen you just don't for obvious reasons so one of the displays they had was a kind of a, a mock modern battle where it was a like three you know bad guys insurgents in a, a, a BMD 2 or a, I don't know some Soviet infantry fighting vehicle and uh, Naturally, the British Army turned up with a Challenger 2 and kind of, you know, it was a little bit one-sided, maybe, a little bit, but, you know, it was, it, we saw some of that. Then we went back inside, or at least I went back inside for uh, food at that point, and that is how they'd set up, as you can see, the, uh, the Wargaming booth. It was really busy both days. There were pretty big queues. I think it was topping three hour queue times at one point. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, you can play it at home, but there are tanks that you can play on those accounts, the, uh, the event accounts, that you just can't play. Um, things like the MTLS, like tanks you literally can't buy. So I can kind of understand why people were willing to queue for so long, but even so, I had vague thoughts of doing it myself at various points during the weekends, and I would always look at the queues and think, no, okay, no, I can just play World of Tanks at home. I'm not that desperate to play it while I'm here. 
QB, you can see there, right next to the, uh, uh, the Wargaming booth, and a bunch of people coming up to him, having their photo taken, and he was doing autographs. Um, Jingles, obviously, elsewhere in the, the, the World War II hall, doing exactly the same thing. He said, but by the end of the day, like it got to the point where he was forgetting how to sign his own autograph because it's like you do something like that over and over and over again, and your brain just at some point falls over. Um, and also, he shook a lot of hands, and his hand was quite sore by the end of the day. There was actually, uh, I think there was an episode of The West Wing, and it must have been season six or season seven. Like um, Alan Alder is playing a, a, a character that's running for president, basically, and in. He has to shake a lot of hands at one point, like they do a thing in an episode where he actually injures his hand because he's shaking so many hands, so yeah, I can only imagine he was uh, uh, feeling like he'd gone there to meet people, but it was a lot of people, <laughs> so he must have been feeling in need of a rest by the end of the day. I also saw some other familiar faces, or heard some familiar voices I should say. This fella here is Mr. Globitz. And I've played with him before in the game. He's got his own clan. I think he, he's, he's got his own YouTube. I think he streams from time to time. And it was funny because I was sitting there eating um, some food and him and a bunch of his clan mates who'd, who'd come along for at least the Saturday. They might have been there on the Sunday as well. But they were kind of looking at me from the other table. I thought, okay, I've been recognised, which was surreal. It happened a couple of times already where actually, like, when I wasn't with Sircon, because Sircon's very recognisable. You know, he has his... his uh, his face on the stream, you know, all the time, basically. Whereas me, I've got my face on a very few videos, but for the most part, like, most people probably don't know what I look like. So it was weird when people did recognise me. So that's what happened. And I, it was, they were kind of looking over at me, and I sort of, you know, sort of waved and thought, okay, well, maybe try and finish my food and then go over and say hello. But then, then they kind of, you know, yelled over their hellos, and I thought, I recognise that voice. So yes, it turned out to be Mr. Globitz. And uh, I spent, I can't remember, it must have been better part of an hour hanging out with him and his, his uh, clanmates. So that was good fun. There's actually a couple of photos here of um, the various tanks that we were looking at when we were wandering around the main World War II hall. And you can actually see in the background there that it had a lot of stalls set up as well. So it wasn't just that outside area next to the, tam uh, the, the tank park where they had all the tents. Um, they actually had a lot of stalls indoors as well. And it's funny, one of the longest queues for anything, apart from people queuing up to see Jingles, was probably the single cash machine that they had near the entrance. It's like, we, we went in on the Saturday morning, and we're like, oh, that's a really long queue, I wonder what that's for. I hope it's not for, like, the only toilets or something like that. No, as it turned out, it was the cash machine, so, yeah. So, um, again, the tanks... Um, like, even the World War II tanks, you don't really get a sense of the scaling game. Like, even something like the Lux that we had a photo of a little uh, a little earlier. Like, like, that's actually quite a big tank. And the only tank that I saw that really was of the scale that you'd think it would be was the uh, the M22 Locust. And I think there's a photo of that um, either... I'll probably drop it in here anyway, but uh, I think that was from the Sunday. But that's a really tiny tank. I mean, it was an airborne-capable tank. It was meant to be dropped in by gliders, but... That, that, like, the, the idea of anybody actually fitting inside that thing, like, that must have been incredibly cramped to drive around in. And, of course, the Brits had their own uh, airborne-capable tanks that, again, not really a huge success just because uh, they were very small, very thinly armoured and had a very limited armament, but better than nothing, I suppose. So at that point, we went back outside. Um, we'd had a look around in the main, the big tank hall. I've actually got a, a panorama of that that I'll probably... Um, I'll stick up on the, the screen either now or at some point later. But um, after a quick wander around the main tank hall and seeing the um, the big information displays, it's like the tank story hall, basically. It's kind of like uh, uh, taking you through the evolution of fighting vehicles from World War One up to the present day. And there's some very um, iconic machines in there. Like they've, they've gone for the more iconic machines, and most of them you will recognise from World of Tanks, and now games like Armoured Warfare, because a lot of them are of the era to be in Armoured Warfare. But at that point we popped outside and went and got some of us more food, others got some refreshments. We had a hurricane fly past at that point. There had been a Spitfire earlier on, but I didn't really get a good view of the Spitfire, um, but the hurricane I got a much better photo of. And after we'd all um, had our fill, we then went to see the main arena event of the day, which they'd actually put at the end of the day, uh, which was a recreation of the final battle of the movie Fury. Wargaming, um, if you don't know, uh, not Wargaming, uh, the Tank Museum, 
they actually um, lent Tiger 131 to the production. I say lent, I'm sure there was money involved, but they also um, gave them the, uh, the the Sherman to use, and obviously the production company, all, you know, they dressed up the Sherman, and the Tank Museum have kept the Fury looking how it was in the film. So you, you can actually see Fury driving around and um, engaging in a mock battle with Tiger 131, and there's actually a... a a Panzer III that was on the field as well, and some other German uh, like half track of some description. Um, somebody, some German armor buff would probably know what that was. But yeah, it was it was um, it was loud. <laughs> like another thing you don't really get from World of Tanks is how loud a tank firing its gun is. And apparently, what was new this year was the fact that they weren't just using uh, charges like on the end of the barrel to simulate the firing. The Shermans were actually using like blank shell cartridges so like the equivalent of firing blanks out of a gun so you're actually firing you know you're using the breach mechanism to to fire the charge and they were loud they were really quite loud so yeah you just you just don't get that in world of tanks but it's probably a good thing because otherwise you'd, you'd have people complaining about burst eardrums or whatever but that was kind of cool the tiger was just pyrotechnic charges on the end of the barrel but it was still like hearing that that very iconic machine driving around the arena um that was quite something as well so towards the end of the day and um, we're getting towards the end of the saturday now i'd better speed up otherwise i'm going to end up with another 40 minute recording which i really don't want but we spotted billy's tank the churchill gun carrier looking in a very sad state there's actually a whole row of these just rusting hulks machines that it's probably a very low priority in terms of putting resources into restoring them just because they're in such a state the cgc unfortunately for billy is one such so as you can see yeah it's not looking particularly happy but it's quite recognizable and i think it's the only surviving one as well like they've built quite a few of them or they converted um quite a few of them and if you don't know actually the the, the story of the cgc it was kind of it was a bit of a stop gap like it was in case we got invaded and we didn't have enough tanks because the tanks that we had had a lot of them got left behind at dunkirk but even then most of them were not adequate like these were early war british tanks the tanks that you think of of, of world war ii of the brits having like the cromwells and the comets and the churchills like they didn't really um start getting used until um sort of 1941 1942 so sort of earlier parts of 1941 you know we had i don't even know what we had cruiser tanks probably matildas so not nothing that would be really like we didn't have the numbers like if we'd been invaded it would have been we'd have been in serious trouble so we had things like that you had things like the blacker bombard like the interim weapons weapons that were meant um not for going on the offensive with that they were weapons that were kind of like last ditch defensive weapons and the cgc was one of those we also saw a much later tank destroyer, a rather ridiculous machine, and that's now in game. It's the FV four thousand and five, or is it four thousand and two? I can't remember. But yeah, that is like the fact that we actually built that thing. It's a bit ridiculous. They've also got the the charioteer in there as well. Um, the, the the what is the tier eight turreted tank destroyer? Well, the tanks for the Brits. Uh, that was actually in the conservation hall, lurking towards the back. There were actually a, a fair few familiar machines. That we saw um, from from both days. So on to the Sunday now, and it was a little more overcast, uh, but the weather was still pretty pleasant. Um, there was actually spots of rain at various points, but uh, it wasn't too bad. You know, it wasn't really anything. I bumped into another familiar group of voices, and I say voices because these are all people I've I've known for a while, and I know their voices very well, but haven't ever met them face to face before and these were the guys from the sgta clan the specialist global tanking of uh, tank academy and some of them like um these guys here that's uh mr we just dingdom who's now got his own clan the dingers and sapaki who is the uh the deputy um something deputy commander i think of sgta and he's also like the personnel officer and i've known him for ages i've known um mr ding over there for ages and meeting them face to face like it was pretty cool and they actually had come bearing gifts for the wargaming eu community team they had brought a couple of the uh, tankers handbook like physical copies of the tankers handbook which is basically a guide and you can go and look this up and download it for free as a pdf a guide for people who want to know how to learn various techniques and improve their their tanking gameplay 
And they'd also bought these things, which were um, little models tanks on kind of very nicely mounted on these kind of wooden plaques and that little little brass inset there with uh, um, the, the, the the date and the logos of uh, SGTA and, the, and Wargaming. So one was for Ektar and one was for uh, Brind, and they were both very um, well received, I understand. Fortunately, I was unable to be there when they were being handed over. I was elsewhere. I was um, at the Q&A session with Victor Kisley, but uh, yeah, they were much appreciated, and I actually also got a shirt, an SGTA shirt, and I've got a photo of that to show you later as well, so yeah, but it was nice meeting them. Um, Gajira was there as well, who is I think the head of the second clan, SGTA 2, and that's actually or, or is he an SGTA? I can't remember. But he's one, another one of the clan officers, and his wife was there, who is also a World of Tanks player, so that's that's uh, Mrs. Gujira, aka Amarak, so yes, they were actually, like it's funny, World of Tanks, like it probably is predominantly played by men, but it's not like there aren't women playing this game as well, and I think there's probably more, probably not quite as many playing uh, as something like League of Legends, but more so than other kind of military games, I would think. But who knows, only Wargaming would have any real idea of the percentages, like the only idea I have is looking at um, is looking at my, uh, my viewer stats for my uh, YouTube channel. So a couple more shots there of the Wargaming booth. Um, you can see how absolutely jam-packed it was. Like They were literally, I think, letting people in to play like one or two games. I think like, you had 15 minutes at most. Maybe there were people brave enough to try going around several times. I don't know. But it was, yeah, it was just incredibly busy. So at that point, we toddled off to the, uh, the Wargaming Education Centre and... If you don't know, uh, like it's, it's funny seeing the Wargaming logo actually over the door, but Wargaming has basically um, ha has helped out the Tank Museum quite considerably at various points. And it's not been totally altruistic. I mean, obviously, the guys making World of Tanks are themselves big fans of that part of, of military history. But also, obviously, Bovington are going to be much more conducive to letting Wargaming come in and measure various vehicles or look at things in the archives. So... Yeah, not totally altruistic. This is Jingles without a beard, by the way. This was his disguise for Sunday. He decided he was going to try and do something for Sunday to maybe not be standing in the same spot for six hours straight, signing autographs and whatever. And it kind of worked up until the point where he went to the Wargaming booth and then, um, yeah, Ektar shouted out, Hey, Jingles, how you doing? And, and there, that was it, cover blown, so... But yeah, it kind of worked, at least for a while. I don't know what he's going to do next year. We'll see. So we were all sitting around waiting for Mr. Kisley and having a, a bit of a chat. And uh, we had basically... Um, we'd been invited to submit questions because obviously he's he's a Russian speaker. Like, he's, he's from Belarus. English is not his native language. But he spoke quite well. But we submitted our questions in advance so he'd have some idea of what he was going to have to speak about, basically. And... We only had an hour, so I don't think any of us got through all of our questions. I got two of my questions answered, and I had a third one. But if you want to see the full thing, um, you can either check out Jingles' channel or Maxwell's channel. Jingles has been breaking it up into segments. Unfortunately, his microphone had uh, problems with interference. Um, like, the, the sound quality is not great on his videos. Max's sounds a lot better. Um, but it's the full whack, basically. It's like an hour and ten minutes long. So, yeah, the man's a talker. He takes as long to answer his questions as Jingles does, if not longer. So, I don't know if that's just a consequence of, of being the CEO of a, a pretty successful company, or if it's just he's a talker anyway. I don't know. But, um, yeah, some of his answers were a bit overlong. I think he could have been a lot more concise, but we did still get some interesting information out of him. So, yeah, um, I do recommend if you've any interest um, in hearing what he had to say, going and checking out that uh, that footage, but I won't be putting any of it in here. So at that point, the day was pretty much done, and it felt like the Sunday had gone by a lot quicker than the, uh, the, the, uh, the Saturday had. Um, I don't know why. I mean, part of it was, I suppose, we were sat for just over an hour in, with the Q&A session, and um, we didn't get to see uh, quite so much, but... It was still a good day, and um, as you can see from the photos, uh, we kind of wandered around a bit afterwards, and 
actually we kind of we we wandered back into the site all um and had a little natter with ektar and the community team as they were starting to pack things up and then as we were waiting to uh uh get a, a taxi back uh I, I think it was back to the train station i can't remember because it's a little bit of a walk but basically all of the army vehicles that had been there for the weekend like the current service vehicles uh, they all went past in a convoy back to wherever it is that they were coming from and seeing them all come thundering past well it wasn't doing the road any favors but it was kind of cool because you got to see all the the vehicles like a lot closer than you would have in the arena but um yeah it, it was just overall i mean it was a really great weekend and i was kind of i was kind of nervous about going down there about being there and and meeting a bunch of people face to face because um, as you may or may not know i'm on the autistic spectrum i've been diagnosed with asperger's so dealing with people is not my strongest area and dealing with big crowds of people is definitely not my strongest area but it actually turned out to be a lot of fun and of course a part of it was that i was I wasn't just there on my own like if i had just been there me wandering around on my own i probably would have been feeling um i would have had a lot less fun but because i was there with people i knew and i was getting to meet up with people i knew then that obviously made a big difference and just everybody i met was so friendly as well like all the people that came up to say hello um at various points i even got given uh, a couple of things like i, I think i mentioned brett 50 with the the, the scorpion him and his uh, i think girlfriend they gave me cookies, very nice cookies as well. And we also, at one point, um, I think it was on the sun. No, it would have been the Saturday. Um, we uh, no, it was the Sunday. No, no, it was the Saturday. Oh, I'm getting so confused. It doesn't matter. They gave me some uh, um, strip waffles, which, if you're Dutch, you'll know exactly what they are. You can actually buy them in the UK now, but they're kind of like a sweet waffle, caramelly thing, and. Uh, yeah, it was kind of like they'd given some to Jingles as well, apparently. And we just totally co coincidentally bumped into each other in the car park afterwards. It wasn't even planned. So, yeah. So, for everyone that did see me, um, I'm I'm glad that I got to, to meet you. Anyone that was there and didn't see me, I think next year we're going to be a bit more organised about it. Uh, there was the suggestion made to the EU team that we should have some kind of organised um, discussion panel or something next year so that people know that they can come along to such and such an area at such and such a time and they will see Jingles or they will see Sircon or they will see me or they will see Maxwell. So next year I think it's going to be a bit more organised that we'll have learned some lessons from it uh, this year. But it was still a tremendous amount of fun and I definitely want to go next year. I'd also like to just go back and see the museum when it's not an event weekend because it was so busy. Um, there were crowds of people everywhere and I think just going back um, during a, a normal day you would get to see a lot more and you would um, get to um, you, you would be much more at liberty to take nice photos of things basically or at least i would so um i hope you've enjoyed this i mean this has ended up being nearly as long as my last one anyway but i think i was a bit less rambly i think i covered uh, a, a lot more of the uh, stuff that i wanted to cover i didn't go off on quite so many tangents um if you enjoyed it um you uh, can say so in the comments below. A big thank you to Wargaming for providing all the clips, and a thank you to uh, viewer David Helms for some of his photos, and Gajira of SGTA for some of his photos. And yeah, you can hit the like button, you can, uh, you can subscribe to my channel, and uh, I hope to see you next year. So as always, stay tuned for more.